Mr. Sushak is a polite man. He thinks Manipur is terminally ill. I think this room has a wider audience and a wider group of human activists who are to worry whether Indian democracy is becoming terminally ill. I think we've got to ask both questions. <clears throat> My role today in this first session is limited. We've got three formidable storytellers and activists, one talking from the point of a conflict perspective, one looking at human rights, one who begins as a victim, becomes a storyteller, and becomes an activist for an entire community. Three perspectives, interweaving, overlapping. I think one of the first things we have to do is listen. And I think listening is a very crucial part of democracy. In fact, it was taught to me in a very brilliant way when I was sitting next to Professor Dinesh Mohan during the 84 riots. He was so stunned, he was weeping, till the Sikh woman next to him caught hold of his hand and said, Beta, mera duty rona hai, tera duty sunna hai. It's my duty to weep and it's your duty to listen. I think we must become listeners. Because what we have here are not just stories. I think the question that is being emphasized here is, what is the relation between time and democracy when a people have to wait so long to be treated as persons and to think of justice? We have three presentations. Edina Yakum, <coughs> who I think begins with the biographical story, moves on to a wider narrative of what it means to be a community. Bablu, an old activist in this sense, and an old friend, I think his sense of human rights, in a way it's coming full circle from Hansraj College to Manipur, back to Delhi to tell Delhi it's time we listen to what's happening. Because Manipur might be a set of symptoms of what's happening to Delhi, actually. Mr. Bhubichand, who I think is one of the most important conflict activists. Who, so what we have is three perspectives, three kinds of storytelling, maybe three kinds of theory, to look at the question of Manipur. And I think what we have to understand and be grateful for is Manip we might be tired of Manipur, but Manipur is not yet tired of Indian democracy. The very fact they're coming back here again and again to talk to us, I think is a hope, sign of hope. So, All right, thank you. Uh, good, morning every, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to, uh, for inviting me today. And I have a great opportunity to experience myself and about my organization today. From more than 20, 30 years, many extrajudicial killing were done in Manipur under the Armed Forces Special Power Act. So this impact of extrajudicial killing form an organization EFIRM, Extrajudicial Execution Victim Families Association Manipur. By the victim families, with Human Rights Alert, Human Rights Law Network, and some other CSO on 11 July 2009. We cried together on the day, sharing each other testimony. All the cases are same. Arrest, arrested or captured from some area and killed in another places. And discussing about what to do with this everyday killing of innocent bread earner of the family, we all are traumatized by the incident. Can't do anything for future. Some are mothers who lost their son and wife who lost their husband. Many children were produced as an orphan, and more than thousands widows are eliminated due to this <coughs> fake encounter in Manipur. More than three or Two or three years from 2009, we met every Monday, uh, every month, and discussing about how to how do we get justice for our loved ones. Then, on 2012, a firm and human rights alert filed a PIL to the Supreme Court about 1528 cases. On 2013, Santos Headgate Commission 
were form and take off six cases from 1528 randomly and investigated. After the investigation, commission ordered that all the six cases were fact encounter and all the deceased person were not involved in any criminal case. They are innocent civilians. The case history is very long, so I will mention shortly. After various short, uh, su Supreme Court hearing on 2016 July, <coughs> Supreme Court ordered to probe all the 1528 cases and to investigate by forming SIT of CBI. Out of 1528, Supreme Court ordered to investigate 92 cases first in 2017, 16 July, uh, 14 July. Then CBI cannot investigate all the 92 cases, thus delaying till one year. On 2017, July 14, CBI investigated about only 42 cases. Two cases, then now seven cases were charged by the CBI against the security forces and police personnel. One case is closed due to lack of witness. This case is really fact, but uh, really fact, but witness cannot be able to stand because they are afraid if they were killed or tortured by the authorities or police personnel, etc. Many of the cases have witnessed, but they are not able to stand. Families were very much worried about the witness. We are collectively struggled for 10 years to stop fact encounter, to get justice and punish the culprit. But it is very unfortunate for the families to close the cases due to lack of witness or evidence. Very easily. Uh, are waiting for more than 20, 30 years by the families to get justice. Some 42 cases were in investigated by the SIT of CBI. Then some 62 cases is at Supreme Court out of 1528. Remaining cases is not even looking, but families calling us every time and asking about their cases. Where about their cases? They want justice or any others as soon as possible. So we are tired of answering them. Every time, every family asking, calling, where about our cases? This is the problem for us. So I request to all the human rights groups and organizers here to discuss what will be the most positive way of getting justice to the family and now I would like to share something about my personal stories. Uh, on, 2000, on 21st January 2009, my husband is went out on his scooter with one of his local friends at about 10.30 a.m. Yeah, it's normally I work as a uh, housewife. I work my normal home works and then nothing is hearing. Then at about 5.30 p.m. from the local ISTV news, uh, some of my localities uh, seen from the news that he is killed in an encounter. Because uh, on that day he himself have his identity card, so his name and his father's names can be identified. Uh, yeah, they were killed, he were killed with, along with one of his friends called Kunja Bihari. They were killed with heavy torture. They were, uh, after that, I heard from uh, some of the area that he was uh, arrested from one college campus and uh, this scooter is uh, driving by one police personnel and uh, killed in a very far places, like 30 kilometers away from the area which they were arresting. And uh, yeah, they were branded as the KYKL group. And they got one uh, AK-47 rifle, then hand grenades. They branded 
them as a uh, insurgent group. Then on the next day, from the side of the insurgent group, they cleared it. But my husband and uh, his friend were not belong to any insurgent group. So uh, we formed joint action committee about his brutal killing and we protest with uh, localities and CSO and we inform to the CM, we give memo mem memorandum to the CM, to the, we report to the DZP, all the authorities. But nothing is getting till today. So uh, we formed this organization and uh, struggle collectively to get justice. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> yeah, in a way, uh, Justice Sishak has laid down the historical perspective quite uh, effectively and quite movingly, and also with the inputs from Idina, uh, the, the, the personal experience of um, being a victim of this situation uh, is laid out quite clearly. Steve have introduced me as transversing between Hansraj College and, and, and Manipur and back to Delhi. I remember the first time I saw a dead body for documentation, I, I was trying to think of what, what is it that, I, that, that pushed me. I was already working as a volunteer in Ravi's office, South Asia Human Rights Documentation Center. I was a, initially an anthropology BSc student, but then I thought, Understanding the world was not enough. I want to do something to change the injustices in it. I went into law, and from my second year law onwards, I started going to Ravi's office in the in the afternoon and and documenting cases. So when I went back home, Ravi gave me an assignment also to do some documentation work, and I got in touch with local groups. There was already a group called the Committee on Human Rights functioning it was more like a strict fight. When we say human rights, it's in Manipur, it's synonymous to anti apspa movement. And uh, there were a lot of angry, anger, a lot of activism, but probably none of the activists have even seen or read the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. But the raw anger against the military atrocity was what was pushing. So th <coughs> there was a small group of people who were document, trying to document cases. So I went with uh, uh, two of these friends and went to the morgue in Regional Institute of Medical Sciences, RMC it was. And because the morgue people and the human rights people were already quite friendly, the latest case of a killing of a young man, uh, it was put in a freezer and they dragged out the freezer. And that was the first time I saw the stillness of death. And the body was bare cold, gunshots all over, and he was wearing an underwear, a Frenchy underwear, of the same color that I usually wear. And actually I saw myself in that, um, we have heard about these stories, we have heard about these APSPA, killing on suspicion, but that they really moved me to actually see and smell the stillness and the rawness of getting killed. I thought, well, I could have been here. I mean, I, I, I took photographs, I brought it back, and soon thereafter, for the first time, Ravi took me to Korea in, uh, the, at that time, um, Asia Pacific Human Rights Facilitating Team, which was very active with uh, um, uh, the post Vienna. Uh, kind of upsurge of human rights and trying to do something at the human rights level. Ravi asked me to make a presentation and I tried to make a presentation and it was an utter failure because uh, Ravi thought that uh, it would, it would it, I was too specific on the thing that Manipur was not even in the map of the world and I was trying to be too specific. But anyway, with all those mistakes, we continued. I mean, 1990s, mid 90s, I left SHRTC, went back home and have been trying to collect this information as much as possible 
uh, and in while collecting this information, the all constant problem that we always try to to steer away is also the idinas of the world, when the wounds are very fresh. Within weeks, there's always a widow. Very often, these are all young people in their twenties and thirties um, who, who are killed in the name of this counterinsurgency operations. And there's always usually a person completely traumatized. Uh, now, Edina has recovered. When we first met Edina, he was half paralyzed uh, because of the trauma, couldn't move out. Uh, of course, with the, with, with, the, with the victims coming together and act, be, becoming activists, and the, the real harbinger of justice in Manipur, there's a huge transformation in the victim community. But when we first went there, it was complete helplessness and hopelessness um, uh, with which we, we saw. In a way, as Anubha was saying, the transitional justice in Manipur had begun long time ago, uh, even before we sit together and try and reflect this. Uh, I think, um, and, the, and the response from the institution have also been very, very, let's say, frustrating. We try to go to the, the police. I mean, the first thing we learn in our uh, criminal law classes is that FIR is a right. Uh, even a phone call is enough to register an FIR. But in many of these cases, we typed out properly the, 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 the way the family have experienced this. We go to the police station, the police station will laugh at you, will throw it to you and say, you can't file a fire against the military. You can't file a fire against the police. He said, but is there an order uh, with which uh, you are saying this? There's no order, but it's all unwritten convention. And this is the impact of 60 years of Absfa. You cannot question the authority. If you are trying to act too smart, you'll have to face the consequences. So it was a frustrating experience. If you are able to gather sufficient evidence and get witnesses to testify, the only option was to go to the high court. And as Justice Sisak was saying, that it was not easy for the judges sitting on the, on the bench even to entertain these complaints. Justice Sisak had, was sharing this experience of how when he was hearing one of these habeas corpus cases, his own house was raided. There was even a more worse case of uh, judicial magistrate Max Fazang, who was pulled down from the bench and tortured with electric shock. He's still recovering from that, he's retired. Uh, but even for the judges and the judiciary, it was not easy to uh, do this. When the first, after uh, Professor Murthy was also mentioning about the uh, Human Rights Committee, I remember in 1997, when India's third report on the uh, the the, um, the uh, ICCPR was being discussed. The Human Rights Committee members were very clear that this use of APSFA is excessive, is, is using emergency law without resorting to Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And therefore, the situation in these regions where there has been disturbed, declared disturbed under APSFA should be carefully monitored, was the recommendation from the Human Rights Committee. Within um, a month, I remember it was July 2000 and, uh, 1997, in August, the final hearing in the Supreme Court on the Armed Forces Special Pass Act case, which is now reported as the Naga People's Movement for Human Rights, uh, was heard. And in November 27, the judgment was pronounced. Um, the judgment upheld the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. However, there was very clearly stated that every case should be thoroughly inquired into. And this is what yesterday the Supreme Court have to reassert itself and say there's nothing wrong in inquiring complaints when people are killed. Uh, only yesterday the Supreme Court have to pronounce this judgment. It widely reported in this in the thing. Uh, so uh, I think that the, the struggle is still going on. In December, 10th of December, 1997, if we go back, the Manipur Human Rights Commission was inaugurated. Uh, Justice Shishak was not the chair at that time. There was one uh, Bhar Justice Bhargava from, um, from Rajasthan who was the chair. 
And we were happy that finally we have a platform where at least human rights can be legitimately talked about. Otherwise, when initially when we talked about human rights, and after I came back from the Human Rights Committee meeting, I was myself picked up by the police and questioned for seven hours for doing anti-national activities internationally. Of course, I was able to convince the uh, police uh, officer that uh, what I'm doing is a legitimate human right and had a copy of the ICCPR in my pocket. And so it was actually, they never paid me, but it was actually a seven hours workshop on ICCPR. I'm joking. Uh, uh, but um, nevertheless, what was interesting is when the Human Rights Commission started functioning, the first Human Rights Commission did a fairly decent job. There were activists involved, and we were trying to use the provisions of the um, Protection of Human Rights Act. And, and so whenever we want to make a complaint on army atrocities or torture or extrajudicial execution, in our workshop, we always ask them, make an extra copy. One to the police officer, one to the Manipur Human Rights Commission. So when the Human Rights Commission receives this and asks the police station, have you filed an FIR, they have to respond, yes. Uh, they can't say after even despite of a written complaint that there's no complaint being filed. This process was quite useful and, and for some time again there was a lull in the, in the atrocity. However, in the next round of appointment of the um, Human Rights Commission, there was a report that the relationship between the Manipur Human Rights Commission and the military establishment has gone very bad. And in order to improve the relationship, they have appointed Lieutenant Colonel Rajender Singh as a member of the Manipur Human Rights Commission. And his previous assignment was military intelligence in Jammu and Kashmir. Therein after the Manipur Human Rights Commission, people were saying it's toothless tiger, but it became actively dangerous because Lieutenant Colonel, of course, receives invitation for cocktail parties in the, in the 57 Mountain Division where the military is and regularly it has become a source of information. It is no longer an, a, an, a commission to deal with the human rights problem, but it's more to deal with problems created by human rights activists. And so when we write complaints and, and when we persuade Manipur Human Rights Commission to look into incidents, the Manipur Human Rights Commission's report was no longer about the human rights violation, but about the human rights activists like us who are doing anti-national activities. And, and so, I mean, uh, the, the impunity is not just about lack of knowledge or lack of understanding or non-functioning of institution, but there's also a very active and a very heavy pressure that comes from the military so that they can operate without any resistance. And, and Human Rights Commission itself became a, a casualty of those kind of pressures and pulls. Now, um, again, the big move uh, that we have m made was with the, with, the, with the capacity to organize the victims together and, and filing these 1528 cases in the Supreme Court. This might have also not never reached the Supreme Court if we had a decent hearing from the government. It was very interesting. When the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Execution, which <laughs> Justice Sanchos Hegre mentioned, came, and he came up to Gohati, and we all went to Gohati, uh, we, we could buy some tickets for justices, but most of us could not afford the ticket, so we took a bus and drove 16 hours to reach Kohati and met him. It was also a moment of catharsis. People thought that, yes, we are going somewhere, at least the, the UN expert is listening to our story. But within uh, two weeks, there was also a very nasty report that came from Telegraph, newspaper from Calcutta, saying that the Union Home Ministry is very concerned about this report that has gone to the uh, from the Manipur uh, groups and um, and therefore three people visas to India will never be granted there in after two Dutch and one British these are friends who have come and visited us once a while uh, but honestly they have nothing to do with this memorandum that was submitted this memorandum was purely a product of human rights groups in Manipur and we pull in all the information that we have been collecting so far starting from the 80s to 90s and put all of them together. So since we are being, again, given this kind of a, a, a black uh, presentation in the media, 
we said, we have nothing to hide. The families are still around, the legal documents are still around, and we said we published this into a report, and anybody who wants a copy can have a copy. We have taken meticulous care to be as precise as possible, but if there are mistakes, please point us out, and we will be happy to change it in the next. So when this report was circulated to friends in, in, in Delhi, when I came next time to Delhi, as I transverse between Manipur and Delhi quite often, um, that was when our friend Colin Gonzalez uh, said, why, are, why don't you file a complaint to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the Supreme Court? Because the Supreme Court is now very active with fake encounters in Maharashtra, in, in, in Andhra Pradesh. In, uh, the Isra Jahan case was quite uh, a topic in 2012 at that time. Modi is still not in power, so it's, it's, a, it's a in thing. But there they are talking about five people, six people, ten people at the max. We are talking about 1,528, which is a, a, a class in itself. So we moved the court after much deliberation. Uh, with initial hesitation, the court has come out with this fact finding uh, headed by Santosh Hegre. Again, it came a complete clean chit to uh, our claims because it was all substantiated by evidence. Uh, and then it came out this, with this uh, historic judgment in 2016. And in 2017, they have come out with this SIT. Now, the present dilemma that we are facing today is that the, 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 the CBI is looking at 42 incidents, whereas we have already provoked 1,528 families creating a hope. So every day, as Idina was saying, we receive phone calls from either two, three, four families. What happened to our case? We have given you our material. We have come and signed the documents. We have given our testimony. What happened to our case? And honestly, we try to convince that, no, the Supreme Court have said they are looking at the constitutional uh, jurisprudence and looking at the criminality of this thing. I mean, we try to convince them, but we know that they are not convinced. They want to know how their loved ones who were killed, as a result of which they have suffered years of trauma, years of handicap of ness of, of years of, you know, that their children are not able to get proper education. What happened to us? What happened to the injustice that is meted out to them? I mean, talking about constitutional jurisprudence, probably that's of interest of lawyers and judges and this thing. But to the family, it's still, we can't convince them that we are doing this as, a, as an emblematic case and therefore your case will not be dealt. So the idea that how are we going to deal with the needs that is emerging from the ground? And, and uh, the, the other question is, of course, to the larger society, uh, how we are going to say that these things will not be repeated, how we are going to uh, uh, say that uh, after this investigation is over, um, that these issues will never be repeated again. I think these are big issues. The other problem, difficulty, is that CBI is doing, of course, a good job. Initially, they were a bit lethargic, thanks to the hammering by the Supreme Court and also from the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Execution and Human Rights Defender, which made a, quite a strong statement in July uh, this year. Uh, CBI seems to be doing some good work. However, there are big problems. Big problems because, as Idina was pointing out, there was one case where uh, CBI has returned FR, saying that the case is not met out. Even though it is common knowledge to everyone in the locality that this guy was brought in, shot dead um, in their locality, nobody is ready to testify. Why should we te testify? Because the, the so-called accused are still in power. They are still police officers. They are still going around with their guns. Their big bosses who are ordering them are still big ministers in the government. So unless and until it's a very personal thing, unless and until it's your family friend, you happen to see uh, as a bystander the killing, nobody is ready to take that risk and come out. And I think this is a very legitimate concern. This was raised by Justice Lukur in the court, saying that this 21 people that is already listed in the, uh, as a list of accused by the CBI uh, are murderers according to you. And if they are still loitering around in a small place like Manipur, how would the victims, the witnesses, and the, and the uh, petitioners uh, react? And Justice 
Lalit have very clearly said the responsibility of the CBI is not to dig up the truth, but also to create an environment where justice can be done. And because they have made this comment, they are also slammed with a petition asking them to be reclused. I mean, the matter was, of course, decided in, 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 in favor of the judges, but the problem is the effect of it, of, of not arresting murder victim, uh, uh, kind of people who are accused of murder is, is felt on the ground in very serious way. And therefore, how much of this remaining uh, investigation will in conclude into a strong charge is also a, a big question. The question is all then also with the trial courts, um, the resources, 42 uh, cases are going to be dealt with. And as Justice Sisak can say, Manipur's judiciary is also perpetually understaffed and under-resourced. Uh, and there are also tremendous pressure on which these people are going to come. Uh, would we, I mean, they, we have already moved six years now. We started the journey in 2012 in the Supreme Court by officially registering. And till now, we haven't seen any uh, clear indication that for sure justice will be done. We are making good progress, unprecedented progress, but we are still seems to be as far from justice as uh, um, we started in 2012. Under these circumstances, what is it that, that we can comprehensively look at justice process? And in all likelihood, the people who are charged are either constables, head constables, uh, or to the maximum uh, ASIs, and never above that point. Uh, so the whole issue of command responsibility is completely left out. So even if you arrest some of these people, convict some of these people, and small, small fries are convicted, the kingpins who have made these decisions, I mean, the, a, a decision to eliminate 1,528 cannot come from an ASI. It cannot come from a head constable. It has come from very high up in the authority. Unless and until we, the justice process reaches those area, I don't know uh, whether we can actually say that after this uh, phase of the Supreme Court monitored standing mandamus, will the situation get worse after it goes, or will it get um, uh, uh, remain the same? So this is the reason why we are moving, that rather than looking at individual cases, is it time for us to look at the whole phenomena of this impunity and APSFA and its application for a prolonged period of time, and some kind of a truth commission that comprehensively looks at the pattern rather than the, the individual would, uh, would make a lot more sense to bring about a sustainable justice, uh, leading to uh, 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 building a more just society and, a, and, 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 and to harbinger as, as a, of, of uh, justice and peace in this society. So this is uh, the, this initiative. We, the reason why we are collaborating with this is to see uh, whether we can think at a larger canvas in terms of uh, what can be done and jo not just confine ourselves to very uh, narrow concept of uh, criminal justice system. The criminal justice system is equally important, but I think perhaps we need to look at the larger picture as well. Sorry, Steve, I've taken a little more time, but let me just see what. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, General Gobel Law School, uh, for giving me this opportunity of sharing uh, our experience and perspectives uh, to bring peace uh, in Manipur, particular in particular in Northeast India in general. Mm. Before coming to uh, my uh, topic, I would like to say that working for human rights and working for uh, conflict transformation and peace building is living with intimidations and harassments and so on so forth. So actually I was also motivated. Uh, that was when I was in grade six, I walked from my home to school. That was the first time I heard a gunshot. Uh, it's nearby my school and that's how uh, I was <coughs> motivated uh, to transform the situation or society. And <coughs> that is uh, how uh, I became first uh, activist uh, 
from my school days. And till now, uh, I'm continuing working with uh, many <coughs> civil society organizations in Manipur. And I had the opportunity uh, to meet Bablu when Bablu came back to Imphal in the 90s and we met and we have been working uh, together and th that is how. And uh, th there were lots of intimidations and harassments even when uh, I was uh, going to abroad for participation in some uh, uh, conflict transformation and peace building forums. I was detained and uh, harassed at the airport not to uh, leave Imphal. That, that was how we are living with in, in, in Manipur, in the conflict situation. And here uh, today, uh, I would like to uh, share some perspectives on the needs of a peaceful society in Manipur, uh, potential role of government and uh, government institutions and civil society. Manipur and its people had faced uh, many challenges and changes in their long recorded history of about 2,000 years. Uh, their beautiful land, flora and fauna had been compared by many to those of Switzerland or just described as the quote unquote land of jewels. In recent history, the latest period when the people live a comparatively prosperous and a peaceful and happy life was before the British Empire conquered independent kingdom of Manipur in 1891. Many issues uh, that create misunderstandings and distrust among various ethnic groups and among geographic and regions in Manipur today can be directly traced to the colonial policies of the British rulers who ruled the rules from 1891 to 1947. The massive physical uh, devastation and the extreme miseries caused by the Second World War, uh, particularly for Manipur 1942 to 1945, was a historic watershed in the minds of the people. It was as if they leapfrogged from one era to another. After the British rulers left Manipur in August 1947, and in the prevailing extraordinary circumstances, the King of Manipur and the political leaders managed to adopt a constitution of Manipur in 1947 itself to hold elections on adult franchise uh, suffrage to a 53 member legislature and to install a council of ministers responsible to the legislature in 1948. The king as constitutional head ruled on aid and advice of the council of ministers. However, the controversial merger of Manipur into dominion of India in October 1949 was a somnolent passage into another historical phase of their life so far as the physically and mentally exhausted ordinary people were concerned. The transition hardly made any material difference for decades to come to the quality of their life. It is hoped that the big background will help us in understanding the cycles of violence that confront us today and hopefully in finding our way to a peaceful society in Manipur. The bumpy road to peace. At the outset, we have to accept that conflict is an unavoidable part of our lives. At the same time, we have to understand that absence of overt violence does not necessarily mean peace. We need to dig deeper to the level of structural violence. This is the kind of violence that we do not usually notice openly 
like armed clashes between two groups of people. Structural violence is a consequence of inequalities and injustices in the social, cultural, economic, and political structures of the people. For example, the caste system in the Hindu society, the ethnocentrism among tribes and other minorities, or the capitalist development model may be cited as good examples of structural violence. Of course, they are interrelated to one another. Until and unless we tackle the issues of structural violence uh, in the particular context, there is simply no possibility of a peaceful society anywhere. Cycles of upper violence will continue to erupt anytime. In Manipur, fortunately, uh, there is no caste system as such among all the ethnic groups, even though the majority of Maitais in the valley are Vaishnavite Hindus. However, varying degrees of ethnocentrism are prevalent among all the ethnic groups in Manipur. The violent classes between Naga and Kuki tribes uh, from 1992-1997 is a classic example of structural violence coming out in the open. It is also linked directly to the British colonial policies since the late 19th century. More than 1,000 lives, mostly women and children, Paris, more than 400 injured, about 369 villages were deserted, and more than 5,000 houses burnt during the classes. Another aspect of life in Manipur worth mentioning is that women are far better placed in the society compared with those in mainland India. Their role in economic activities is so important that three big old women markets occupy the center of Imphal. The women had also played historic roles against British colonial rule, and as the Mirabaibi, they are today human rights defenders against human rights violations under the umbrella of Armed Forces Special Power Act, APSWA. Undoubtedly, women will play a crucial role in our quest for a peaceful society in Manipur. There are no doubt issues like chronic capita uh, uh, capitalism, and increasing economic inequalities. Pervasive corruption, growing crimes against women and children, etc. all of them having a bearing on the structural violence. Yet, subsuming all other issues is the impact of APSFA on almost every aspect of life in Manipur. It should not surprise anyone, for it has been continuously imposed on three generations of the same people. APSFA is the outward political symptom of structural violence embedded in the relationship between the people in mainland India and the people in Manipur. As openly articulated in United Nations Fora, APSFA is not just an instrument for granting immunity to armed forces from even heinous crimes. It is also an embodiment of racial discrimination. Because the racial, social, cultural, economic, and political roots of the people of Manipur were historically intertwined with those of the people in South East Asia until 1949. Unfortunately, it seems the powers that be are not yet confident of Manipur people's loyalty to India. So, the way forward, uh, to be realistic, I may be uh, too skeptic. Real, uh, realistically, there is no likelihood of APSPA being withdrawn from Manipur in the near future. The way forward is to pretend that there is no elephant in the room and go ahead with initiatives that can change the lives of ordinary people particularly the victims of human rights violations for the better. It is tempting to think about a form of truth commission as done elsewhere to find the truth regarding hundreds of extrajudicial executions that allegedly took place over many years in Manipur. Apart from being a kind of novelty in India, the idea is unlikely to fructify in the above circumstances, 
and it may be more appropriate to seek redress from them, from the Supreme Court, instead of hoping a positive response to the idea of a truth commission from the government. It depends on the efforts of the civil society to find another feasible way of finding the truth, of holding the perpetrators to account, and of redressing the families of fact and counter victims let out of the criminal prosecution by the CVI. The answer may lie in some form of transitional justi uh, justice as the present uh, conference may deliberate on. And the efforts of civil society may also eventually lead uh, to tackling fundamental issues of structural violence in the relationship among the peoples in India and hopefully to a peaceful society in Manipur. Thank you.